Good day, and welcome to Rules of Rhythm. Remember that we are trying to apply these concepts to the critically ill COVID-19 patient, as well as other critically ill patients under our care. So we want to think about rules of rhythm as it relates to the presence and absence of ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and what that means to us at the bedside when we're evaluating our patients. And so, to begin, rules of rhythm. The rules for normal cardiac rhythm. First of all, we all know this one. Your normal heart rate should be between 60 and 100 beats per minute. All impulses should originate from the very top of the heart down to the very bottom of the heart. And those impulses should begin at the sinus node. If they begin at the sinus node, they travel through internodal pathways are gathered by the AV junction and then transition down into the right bundle branch and the two divisions of the left bundle branch. That's how the impulse should move. It should conduct through a normal conduction pathway, sinus node, internodal path, AV junction, uh, right and left bundles, and into the Purkinje fibers, and they should do so with a normal velocity. Time, the time it takes for the impulse, and the amount of impulse it takes, voltage, are incredibly important when we're looking at electrical and mechanical responses. And all of us know you can have electrical without mechanical, but you can never have mechanical without electrical. So, we take a look at that normal electrical conduction system, the firing of the sinus node, the transition through both right and left atria, through the internal pass, the gathering of the impulse in the AV junction, the transfer into what we call the common bundle of His, which is pre-bifurcation of right and left bundles, and then ultimately delivered into the ventricular myocardium by the Purkinje fibers. Now this is all your normal electrical pathways. It should always progress in this way, but we know that patients don't read the book and they don't behave the way we'd like them to in terms of their physiology and even in terms of their pathology. So the primary pacemaker tree or the intrinsic pacemaker cells are those cells that are designated to depolarize before the rest of the myocardial tissue. These cell groups are in charge of the heart. Now, number one commander is the sinus node. That's the primary activator. Normally depolarizes or fires at a rate of 60 to 100. But by the way, if your sinus node fails, your AV junction will become the secondary pacemaker and the AV junction fires at a rate of 40 to 60. And by the way, if your sinus node and AV junction fail, your Purkinje fibers will fire and they traditionally fire at a rate that's around 40. Sinus node first, 60 to 100. If the sinus node fails, AV junction fires at a rate of 40 to 60. If the AV junction and the sinus node fail, the ventricular Purkinje fibers will fire at a rate of 40. Now when we see an AV junctional rhythm at a rate of 40 to 50, our goal will not be to suppress that junctional rhythm, rather to stimulate the sinus node, because the sinus node should be in charge of the heart. And when the sinus node is in charge, the atria respond by contraction, which ultimately increases the filling of the ventricle. When the AV junction is in charge of the heart, the atria and the ventricles contract at the same time, so you have a significant loss of ventricular filling. And then, if the Purkinje fibers are in charge of the heart, you start at the bottom of the heart and depolarize upwards, which is completely anomalous and profoundly affects ventricular filling. If the AV junction is in charge of the heart and it's firing to escape death, that's called an escape rhythm, which is called a junctional escape rhythm. If the ventricle is firing and is firing at a low rate, that's because you've had failure of the sinus node and failure of the AV, whoops, oh, that way, AV junction, then the ventricular firing at rate of 40 is called ventricular escape or idioventricular. We never suppress an idioventricular rhythm 
Rather, we stimulate the sinus node because that's what's supposed to be in charge of the heart. So, when we correlate this occurrence, the electrical depolarization of the atria, followed by an atrial contraction, is the visual of the P wave. The P wave is not the sinus node firing, but rather the conduction through the atria. The P wave tells us about how the atria depolarizes and contraction follows depolarization. The QRS complex is the symbol of the electrical conduction through both right and left ventricle, almost simultaneously in a normal heart. And that ventricular depolarization actually obscures the visualization of the atrial repolarization. And ventricular depolarization is followed by ventricular contraction. And that should be just about simultaneous, right and left at the same time. The T wave is the ventricular repolarization uh, occurrence, and that actually is the beginning of mechanical relaxation or the resting phase. Now, what's really important here? The P wave causes atrial contraction. The QRS causes ventricular contraction. From the T wave to the next QRS, called the TP interval or the TQRS interval, is the time that your ventricle is allowed to fill with blood. So you might remember from the last sequence where I talked about a rapid heart rate, right? Eject, 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 eject. You always want to have more time for filling. So from the T wave to the next QRS, is the phase of time that your ventricle is filling with volume. The better your ventricle fills, the more volume it will eject. And it's important again to remember, you must have electrical to have mechanical. You can have electrical and no mechanical response such as you do in any PEA arrest. You've got an obstructive shock, a big pulmonary embolus, you have a uh, hemo massive hemothorax, massive pneumothorax, you have obstruction and you have PEA because you have an electrical rhythm but no mechanical response. You can never, ever, ever, ever have a mechanical response without electrical activation, which is why we spend so much time talking about the heart rhythm and looking at those independent, independent waveforms to help us understand electrical activation and mechanical response. Now, Taking a look at an EKG, what we're going to remind ourselves is the P wave is the visualization of conduction through the atria. And after the P wave, we have a short segment known as the PR segment. P wave is electrical, and during the PR segment, the atria contract. Then we have the QRS. The QRS is the relay of electrical information through the ventricular conduction pathways, common bundle, bundle of his, Purkinje fibers. But what follows after that, the electrical rest, known as the ST segment, is when our actual ventricular contraction occurs. So the P wave followed by atrial contraction during PR segment, the QRS followed by ventricular contraction during the ST segment, and then the electrical repolarization known as the T wave. Now, why is this so important to us? We care about how long your PR segment is because that's what allows time for atrial contraction. We care about how long the time of the ST segment is, is because that allows the time for ventricular contraction. But even more importantly, you'll note when you're looking at this EKG that you have a straight line, no current. P wave, current change, straight line, no current. QRS, current change. Straight line, ST segment, no current. T wave, repolarization. So if you look at the line before the P wave, the line after the P wave, and the line after the QRS, that should all be on a straight line and there should be no current of flow. Well, that's really important because when our PR interval, our PR segment is up or down, you've got current. When the ST segment is up or down, you've got current. 
Should you ever have current during those straight line times? Not if cells are healthy. When cells are unhealthy, you will have current of flow. The current will flow during PR segment. See that a lot with pericarditis. Pericarditis is a big deal with COVID-19 patients. And your ST segments elevated or depressed because you have current between healthy and unhealthy cells. And this is also something that we can see frequently with myocardial infarction and myocardial infarction in COVID-19 patients. Now, electrophysiology, always really important to understand resting. In resting, inside your cell is some potassium, outside your cell is potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and sodium. That means there's a potential for change, and that's because there are ions outside the cell and ions inside the cell. Outside the cell, sodium is higher than inside the cell at rest. Calcium is much higher outside the cell than inside the cell at rest. Potassium is higher inside the cell than outside the cell at rest. And we have small channels that actually are stimulated to open to allow potassium to move out of the cell and sodium and calcium to move into the cell. When sodium and or calcium move into the cell, depolarization shift in poles occurs. Those small selective channels actually are powered by active pumps, by exchangers, and just by the electrical difference outside and inside the cell. Now those ion selective channels, we're just going to mention sodium channels, which open the door really quickly for sodium to rush in, and calcium channels, which open their doors really slowly for calcium to plod in. Calcium dependent cells are atrial. That's why you get a wide, plotty looking P wave. Ventricular cells are sodium dependent. That's why you get a rapid up and a rapid down because sodium moves in and then out of the cell. That's why you get a big waveform with ventricular depolarization, sodium channel dependent, and a small, wider waveform with atrial depolarization because they're calcium channel dependent. But both channels are affected by the presence of potassium. Okay, so what does that mean? Even though we'll talk about it again later, what that really means is calcium dependent dysrhythmias, those would be atrial dysrhythmias, atrial fib, atrial flutter, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, are either potassium or calcium dependent channels. And therefore, our drug of choice will be a potassium channel antagonist like amiodarone or a calcium channel antagonist like cardizem. Ha! Huh, go figure. With ventricular dysrhythmias, PVCs, bigeminy, trigeminy, VFib, VTAC, we used to give sodium channel antagonists, and sometimes we still do. Those are agents like... Um, lidocaine, like quinidine, like prenestol, but we don't usually use those agents as a frontline agent. Actually, with ventricular dysrhythmias, our frontline agent is bum ba da da amiodarone. So on any test where you're trying to differentiate wide QRS tachycardia, is it VTAC? Is it uh, atrial flutter? The answer? is still going to be amiodarone. Amiodarone, both calcium and sodium channel dependent cells which rely on potassium, amiodarone is a potassium channel antagonist. We love amiodarone, especially if we have to take a mega code on ACLS because we no longer have to differentiate is it a calcium dependent dysrhythmia or a sodium dependent dysrhythmia. We just give everybody amiodarone. Woo! Okay, so that brings me to this incredible, lovely visual, which don't get too worried, don't get too worried. What you're looking at on your left-hand side is the pacemaker activation and action potential, and on your right-hand side, the ventricular action potential. 
So what you're seeing with our pacemaker cells is that they're much closer to the dotted line. The dotted line is what we call threshold. Threshold is when we open the door and say, sodium, come on in. Or we open up the door and say, calcium, plod on in. That's what we call threshold. Pacemaker cells are close to threshold. Sinus node is around negative 50. AV junction is around negative 60. Uh, the Purkinje fibers are around negative 80. And all the rest of the tree, every other cell is at negative 90. He who reaches threshold first, meaning opening the channels, he who reaches threshold first is in charge of the heart. Maybe for just a beat, maybe for a rhythm. So when I have ischemic myocardium, my ventricular cells become closer to the threshold. They open their channels. They stimulate the depolarization. And they're in charge of the heart. Makes a lot of sense when we talk about it in that way. So I don't want you to forget, in critical care, amiodarone can treat either atrial or ventricular dysrhythmias, except for TDP, torsade de point. That's something different. We'll talk about that later. But very important to remember that if the dysrhythmia is ventricular and it's refractory to amiodarone, your cardiologist may choose lidocaine, they may choose prenestal, they may choose rhythmol, propafenone. There may be other agents that they choose. If we use amiodarone for atrial fib or flutter and the patient is resistant to that, then we often will move to calcium channel antagonists. So remember, potassium channel block for both atrial and ventricular, for atrial only that are refractory to potassium channel antagonism, we might give beta blockers or we're going to give calcium channel blockers. And in the ventricle, if we're refractory to amiodarone, then typically we're going to move to a sodium channel antagonist and that requires a cardiology consult. Okay, cool. So that's really great because action potential is a really important part of understanding cardiac physiology. All right, so excellent. Before we begin acute cardiac syn uh, syndromes, I'd like to be sure that you A, have read your articles that are posted on the website, and B, that you're able to apply these strategies when evaluating your patient's rhythm and abnormalities. Okay, very good. I'll see you next time. Thank you.